Hello everybody and welcome back to Brewmasters where we interview tabletop game designers to get their insights on the craft. This week we're talking to Rain Junkie, the man behind the Dragon Knight class, a massive variety of subclasses, and more recently the Exemplar class. Before we get to that though, this is your regular reminder to like and subscribe and make a DC15 dex check to click that bell icon so you get notified whenever a new video comes out. Uh, just to let you know, there is a content warning for this episode as we discuss sexual assault regarding the Adam Cobell controversy that happened a while back. Uh, if that's something that we're all going to be upset by, then feel free to skip that section. Uh, it's just after the fan submitted question and you can go straight to the homebrew challenge to avoid any discussion of it. With that out of the way, let's get to it. Hey Rain, it's great to have you on the show. Really appreciate you making the time and coming up. That's all right. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be on the show. Finally, obviously, it's something we've discussed for a while, and I kept putting it off because I am busy, kind of. Also, just a bit, <laughs> a bit of a procrastinator. Um, but no, I'm super happy to be here with you. Absolutely. I mean, I've been really excited to have you on the show just because you've worked on so many brews that I'm a big fan of. Like, I've downloaded pretty much all of them. I think. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that. No, one of the big things for me when homebrewing is just making sure. I'm making content that people can enjoy. So I'm, I'm so glad to hear that you enjoy my work. That actually means so much to me. Absolutely. So I'm curious, where did you begin your like path in tabletop role-playing games? Like, where did you start? Okay. So officially in tabletop role-playing games, I would have started with Dungeons & Dragons, 5th edition. I would have been in high school at the time, probably around the age of 16. My fr I think Critical Role had just started. One of my friends was into it, introduced the rest of us, introduced the rest of us into it, and very quickly we were coming up with a campaign, creating characters, all those good things. Obviously, as angsty teenagers, we would use these games to like basically get out of all get out all our frustrations on each other. So like we'd kill each other's characters and be like, oh, it was just what my character would do because we were <laughs> angsty teenagers. But we no longer have that that angst anymore. Thankfully, we're able to enjoy uh, much more wholesome games. Um, but even before then, me and my friends, we would um, like set up like these like mini role play sessions where we would like pretend we were in like a zombie apocalypse, and like one person would narrate, and the rest of us would just have like a d6, and the narrator would ask us to like, oh, like, oh, you try to like use this weapon, roll the d6, see what happens, and then we'd like swap narrator around. So even before we were playing D and D, we were doing these super like informal role playing games, and I didn't like I didn't think too much about it at the time because I didn't like I didn't even know about D and D. But looking back, it's like kind of amazing that like I was even back before I was playing D&D, I was still kind of like really into role playing. Yeah, interesting. And yeah, I think that's like quite an early, uh, sorry, quite a late start uh, compared to some of the other people I've had on. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, I grew up in, I grew up playing a lot of video games, not necessarily into super like fantasy stuff. I was definitely more of like a Pokemon kid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, like all my all my siblings and I would play Pokemon and like I was really into it. Still am kind of leaning away from it a bit more these days. But yeah, I am glad I eventually found the hobby. Um, I do kind of wish I found it a bit earlier, though. I think it's something I would have enjoyed a lot, like if I was a bit younger as well. But I'm glad I found it eventually. <laughs> well, I think we all are. <laughs> <laughs> And how did uh, you first get interested in homebrewing specifically, like creating your own content? Homebrewing. That's a good question. So my friend was playing a, it's kind of two things. First was that I saw, oh, I believe it was either Irish Bandits, who now goes by Kale Reader, I believe, his <laughs> rule of law, or it was John Man's Dark Arts Player's Companion. Hmm. It was one of the two. I just kind of stumbled across it online, and I was like, that's really cool. Like, this is so awesome. And then, additionally, at the same time, my friends and I, we were talking about, like, man, what if there was, like, a class where you could, like, have a dragon? Like, how cool would that be? And I was like, yeah, how cool would that be? And I kind of stumbled across these books, and I'm like, you know what? I bet I can do that. And so that's kind of that's kind of where it started for me, was I... I started with the Dragon Knight class, really. So that was your first homebrew? It was my first homebrew. The first version of Dragon Knight, oh boy, it's a mess. Um, and so is, the, <laughs> so is the second and kind of the third as well. And from there it got a bit better. 
Um, it was like a half cast or it had basically like rage, but not really, and like stronger. And like there were like, I think there were like 10 different subclasses because I did like a d- different subclass for every dragon type. It was a whole mess. It was a whole, whole mess. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> but eventually I refined it and refined it and refined it and refined it. And now we're up to version eight as of this recording. Hopefully I don't have to do a version nine at any point. Um, <laughs> I like to think it's done at this point. Um, but no, I am really happy with how Dragonite has progressed. I think it's definitely one of my proudest works and it's what, it's what I'm most well known for. Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, absolutely. It's something to be proud of. Like, I mean, I'm playing the class at the moment in, uh, my friend's tomb of, uh, annihilation game. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that. I'm so glad that you're playing it. I hope you enjoy it and I wait what subclass are you playing uh I'm playing the writer yeah the writer's one I'm probably one of my favorite I actually interestingly the writer when I was like conceptualizing kind of dragon eye I think this would have been early on probably version four I was talking to Kaim Kaim Dance hmm. Nimadim man of many <laughs> names also man of many many skills um about dragon eye I was like oh, I'm really struggling to like figure out this subclass because obviously I think every class needs to have like the class plus subclass mm. where it's kind of like it just kind of knuckles down on what the class wants to do and in Dragon Knight's case that's Ride Dragons and so I was talking to him about it and I was like oh I'm just I just really feel like I can't grasp this subclass and he's like you know what I'll make you an offer because he takes commissions even back then he was taking commissions and he was like I will if you pay me five dollars I will write the subclass for you. And he like, his commissions were normally like 10, maybe 15 bucks. And I was like, you know what? That's a steal. I'll, I'll take that. And so he wrote the writer subclass for me. And I, and the second I saw it, I was like, what he had written, I was like, that's fantastic. That is so good. So on the money. And even when I was like, continued to update Dragonite past, probably that was like version four, maybe version five. Like that subclass never changed. Like, mm. Elemental got updated, Shadow got updated, like, Platinum got added, then changed into Valiant, and then, like, another Platinum subclass got added. And throughout all of that, Rider never changed. Because, like, the way Kaim had written that subclass just aged so well throughout all these different versions of Dragon Knight. Which is really a testament to his brewing skill. Yeah, that dude is talented. Like, <laughs> just able to pull stuff out so quickly. I know, and his game knowledge is so astounding. One thing that's almost frustrating is that when I'm like, when people like review my work and they might say like, oh, I don't think like this is balanced or I'm not sure about like this class overall, as far as balance goes, I can't say, I can say to some people, I can say, oh, it's fine. Kimes reviewed it and he said it's okay. So it's fine. Because <laughs> some people I can say that to and they're like, oh, great, cool. No worries. But then some people, they're like, who's Kime? Why does his word matter? And I'm like, damn it. You don't, you don't know. <laughs> Yeah, that is like a seal of approval. Yeah, the Kaim <laughs> seal of approval is absolutely the best thing to get, I think, on your homebrew. Because so, like, he's worked on so much stuff. Like, I think he reviewed almost the entirety of Genuine's uh, Compendium of Forgotten Secrets Awakening. Yeah. I think he helped John and Man go through Dark Arts Player's Companion a bit more recently. I said recently, like within like the last year. Mm. Um, he's just He's worked on so much stuff. It's like fascinating that he's like had an impact on so many different home, so much different homebrew that you, that you wouldn't even think it. Yeah. His range is quite impressive. Like, And he keeps himself with such a low profile that you really wouldn't know. Like it's this sort of like industry secret. <laughs> yeah, it is a bit. It is a bit. So with Kaim giving you feedback like that, um, I suppose that brings us into the larger picture of giving and receiving feedback criticism and feedback like uh how would you uh expand on that um giving and receiving feedback one one big statement i have to say about giving and receiving feedback is i think giving feedback is a skill i think i think it's really actually quite difficult to be someone that, that gives good feedback um and what i mean by this is that if i like let's say i approach someone's homebrew I see that they've written a class. Maybe it's like the dancer. They've written a dancer class. Mm-hmm. If I jump into the comments and I say, that's a crap class. This should be a subclass. That's not good feedback. That doesn't help them. 
<laughs> like, and this is something you see a lot. You'll see people say, oh, like you've written this class, maybe it's a subclass, maybe it's a magic item, it's a spell, whatever. They'll say, oh, you've written it like this when really it should be this. Mm. And that doesn't help anyone because they want to write a class or a subclass or a spell. And while it's absolutely true that like maybe a dancer could be compounded into a subclass and just have just as much theme, they want to write a dancer class, so help them write a dancer class. Don't sit there and like belittle them. Because one thing that's really important, I think, when giving and receiving feedback is trying to help the author maintain the integrity of their homebrew. Because you don't want to you don't want to sweep in and just be like, oh, I don't like what you've done, change it all. Because mm-hmm. like, it's not their homebrew anymore. You've kind of just like you've swept in, you've like changed the curtains, you've taken out their couch, you put in your own couch, and you're like, nice, we fixed the we fixed the room. It's like you haven't fixed the room; it's your room now. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, and so that's a big thing when dealing with feedback, and I think it's why I think I have a bit of a reputation for not taking feedback very well, and part of this is because I'm used to having Kaim say like kind of breeze through and say like like tick 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 tick, and I'm like great done. And of course, I like I speak to heaps of people when I'm writing my stuff before it even like hits Unearthed Arcana. Like I've probably talked to like ten different homebrewers. Like I'll often talk to like not the smooths. I might talk like to Leonette or like Sword Meow, or I might talk to Genuine, or I'll talk to Jono or something. Hmm. And and so I'm already getting lots of feedback before my st- um stuff hits Unearthed Arcana. And that's not to say that like the feedback I get from Unearthed Arcana isn't valuable because sometimes it is. But often I find a lot of the feedback I get from Unearthed Arcana is the kind of, I don't like this, I think you should do it this way. And that's not really feedback I enjoy getting because I want to do it my way. And I think I would like it if people help me do it my way rather than just telling me to do it their way. Yeah, it's the difference between like trying to improve on your brew and trying to make it their brew. (laughs) Exactly. That's like dead on exactly what it is like. And it's just, it's a bit unfortunate, but it's, I mean, it's, that's what I, that's what I mean by saying like giving feedback is a skill. And I, I, I say that and it's not a skill I have. I think I am notoriously bad at giving balanced feedback. If anyone ever comes to me and says, oh, Blake, what do you think of this? I'm like, it's nice. I think this bit's fun. And that's usually the extent of my feedback. If you ask me to review aesthetics, I'm great at that. Really good at like going through and saying, oh, this should change this like doesn't look super great. I would maybe tweak this image. I would maybe move this one around. Maybe consider finding different art here. I'm good at that. Mm. But as far as balance feedback goes, whenever anyone tells me, oh, like, what do you think about like maybe this feature, this like this spell? Usually my feedback is it's nice because I have a good gut instinct for my own stuff when I'm balancing and writing and all that. But when when it comes to other people's stuff, no clue. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Yeah, I think like a lot of people seem to think that when you're trying to impart like advice on someone looking for it or like the feedback, that it requires you to have like some kind of greater knowledge or experience. And largely, I think it's just helpful to come at it from a player's perspective. Like, do you think that if you had this compared to all the other stuff you've played, it would be more powerful or less powerful? Like, I mean, it doesn't take like math to figure this stuff out (laughs) yeah no absolutely agree and actually that's something else i don't like i have so many things i don't like (laughs) one thing i don't like is when like i'll may i might drop something in a homebrew like maybe on a dakana and someone will like drop into the comments and they'll be like oh i've run all these numbers to show you why i think your thing is broken and it's like (laughs) that's nice thank you for doing that and in some cases, they have a point. In some cases, you might see that their maths is correct. Maybe like your thing is wildly overpowered. And you're like, oh, thanks for letting me know. I'll turn it back. But other times, it's like it does three more damage than it probably should. And I don't really think that's an issue at the end of the day. Mm. Or it's like these maths are taken in like super like white room situations where it's like you're not really considering like that D&D fights can be complicated. They can be messy. There's like terrain. There's obstacles. There's other things going on. And like combat isn't this like perfect white room where like i go you go i go you go you know and that's what a lot of those like math situations take place in and so well i think maths is good for balancing absolutely i don't think it's like it's not the be all and end all of homebrew balance a lot of it is feeling 
because yeah, I mean, your work's going out into like this infinite pool of possibilities. Like you don't know how any one game is going to run or where it's going to end up. Even if you're running a pre-made adventure, like there are unknown variables. <laughs> exactly. And like, even when I put something out into the world, someone could take that and they might adapt it. Right. Mm. Like there could be a version of drag, some like they could potentially out there, someone's playing Dragon Knight and they've adapted it for like their spacefaring game and they've turned their dragon into like an alien monster. That could happen. That could happen. That'd be awesome. But like, yeah, that's just like a big consideration for me is like, not only am I writing things people are going to enjoy, am I writing things that people can tweak if they want to? Is it easy to take my homebrew and go, oh, I'll like, I'll turn this dial a little bit because just to suit me. Which is why when I write, especially things like flavor, I try to leave my flavor very open-ended when I write homebrew. And some people don't like this. I know I've gotten a few discussions about it with Izzy, where we Izzy likes to like really knuckle down on what, what the flavor of something is, where I'm very much like, I'm happy for the player to sort it out. For example, um, my Titan class, very loose on where their magic actually comes from. I'm like, they self-sacrificed in some meaningful way, now they're a Titan. And the reason I did that is because I want a player to be able to work with their DM. They want, obviously, if you're playing homebrew, you're probably going to need to show your DM and be like, hey, can I play this? Hopefully you're doing that. Please do that if you want to play homebrew. Um, <laughs> and hopefully they're showing their DM saying, hey, I want to play this Titan. And then the DM can like take the Titan, see that the flavor is fairly open-ended and say, okay, let's, I can think about how this fits into my world now, how this fits into my story. And it's like our story, really, as D&D is like a collective story. And so that's why a lot of my, cause like I do get this criticism a lot, is a lot of my flavor is very open-ended across all, like all my work. And that's kind of the reason I do it is to make sure that um, players are able to like tweak it and adapt it for games so that it suits them and it suits their DMs as well. Yeah, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Like it seems more versatile, if anything. Yeah, no, absolutely. And like there's nothing wrong with wanting super intense flavor like i know genuine writes fantastic flavor for his work and it's like really interesting to read and like see where his brain goes with all that like it's fascinating and there's people there's players out there that really enjoy that and good for them i'm glad that kind of content exists for them but i want to make sure i'm making content for other people who are maybe like i don't really care i want to play a cool i want to play a cool sorcerer that can grow flowers on people and i don't really care how that works out you know yeah 100 percent because, I mean, there is, like, obviously the pros and cons. Like, I mean, I too love, like, Genuine's work, but you do kind of have to incorporate his pantheon of, uh, like, uh, patrons into your campaign for that book to really, like, settle in properly. Exactly, exactly. Which is almost a testament to how well it's written, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I love Genuine. His work's fantastic. Absolutely. I think um, he was mentioning he wants to come back on the show at some point, which I'm looking forward to. <laughs> oh, he absolutely should. Absolutely should. I think like one thing I actually do want to do at some point is have um, a lot of the season one guests uh, back on, but like in group discussions. Oh my gosh. I was actually thinking about this earlier. I was thinking, do you know what would be really cool if you did? It would be if you had like a plethora Okay, maybe not a plethora, because maybe if you had too many people, it might get a bit out of control. But, like, a group of homebrewers, <laughs> and then you just, like, present them with really controversial D&D &D opinions and kind of just let them have at it. <laughs> be the funniest show ever, honestly. That could one be thing, a recipe for disaster, but I'm totally about it. It probably would be a recipe for disaster. but Because one thing I find in homebrew is a lot of people have really strong opinions about things that don't really matter. And what, what I mean by this, it's like my catchphrase, what I mean by this hmm. is that, for example, I really do not like it when a subclass or even a class, basically it's subclasses, gives you the options to pick spells from another class's spell list. Bard aside, Bard's fine, but like the Divine Soul Sorcerer, I do not like that part of it. Do not like that you get to pick cleric spells as a sorcerer. I just think that's a recipe for disaster. It opens up so many like holes in the design, and suddenly sorcerers can get like healing word, one of the strongest spells in the game. 
and like spiritual weapon. And it's just like, what is this? These shenanigans that can ensue from just a sorcerer having cleric spells. And like at the end of the day, it's not a huge deal, really. Like there's a few things that make you go, uh, unsure. But like in 90% of cases, that's going to be fine. And like that's, but that's something I feel really strongly about. Something you'll never see in any of my homebrew is a class being able, a, a subclass letting you pick like different spells from like other classes spell lists specifically. I think expanded spell lists are fine and the better way to do that. But then w- when you think about it like that, every single person that ha- writes homebrew probably has an opinion like that where they feel very, 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 very strongly about it. And in the end, it doesn't probably matter that much. But when, they, when they're giving you feedback, they might be coming from that place. They might be saying, oh, I really don't like companions. I think companions are like completely busted in d and I don't think they have a place in the game. And so if that person was to see Dragonite, they'd be like, this is complete trash and I hate it. <laughs> Even though that comes from a bit of a weird place. But like, I think everyone has stuff like that that makes them go like, re- like revulse in pain and agony at the sight of such a mechanic. And it's just like, it's just because we don't, it's just because people don't like it. Yeah, like everyone has their hill they want to die on. <laughs> exactly. Everyone has a hill they want to die on. And some of those hills are fine, like m- maybe thinking that the ranger class is bad and needs to be revised 20,000 times. <laughs> maybe your hill is that Hexblade is bad and just should be removed from the game. Good hill. I support people who stand on that hill. Maybe your hill is that multiclassing sucks. I also stand on that hill. Um, but like everyone has those hills. And I think it's just about making sure, especially when you're having like conversations with people about and kind of navigating how you feel about those kind of topics and making sure that you're kind of respecting each other's opinions, even if you don't necessarily agree. Yeah, it's all about um, really just having conversations and like furthering the wider discussion. Like, Absolutely. Absolutely. No one wants to end up like drawing lines in the sand and dividing the community. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So when it comes to like controversial homebrew decisions in general, um, mm-hmm. I guess you have to accept that just sometimes some ideas aren't going to work more than others. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely the case. Actually, I have a few things to say on that as well. So yeah, feel free. One thing, I have two examples, one that I've published and one that is still sitting in like my GM binder folders, never to see the light of day. Uh, and the big thing here, thing here is that Sometimes ideas don't work. Example, conduit, my conduit class. Uh, There is a reason that class no longer exists in my drive. And so for those that don't know, and I think I, I'm not sure if I deleted it off my, as a submission to Unearthed Arcana. I don't think I did, but I might have. I'm not sure. Regardless, uh, I wrote a class, the conduit, where they could basically, what I wanted to make was I wanted to make a kind of a blasting class like an AOE kind of blaster, magical blaster, that scaled like a marshal, didn't use spell slots. And it was crap. Um, <laughs> the fact that that class saw the light of day, not good. Uh, the biggest problem with it was that it was basically forcing the DM to roll like probably maybe like 8 to 12 saving throws on each of your turns. Oh, wow. And it just bogged it bogged down combat so much and it was just super boring it just didn't really like do anything interesting and a lot of the time I look at that class and I'm like maybe I can revitalize it maybe I can bring some spark back into it and I'm like you know what I just don't think it I don't think I'm the person that had I don't think I have the capacity to write that class to the way I want it to be written hmm. I think that's a big thing an important thing to recognize as a homebrew is you may have a really good idea, but you may not be the best person to write it. Um, one of my friends, not the Smooze, is writing a class very similar to Conduit. Not the Smooze and I write a lot of things that are very similar. Half the time I'll message her saying, oh, I've had this idea. And she'll just be like, oh, I've written that. I'll be like, really? Crazy. Show me it. <laughs> um, but she's writing a class very similar to Conduit. I think I even told her to just take the name Conduit because it's a good name. Um, that's that idea, and I think she's going to do a better, way better job than I did because I just think she has a better grasp of what she wants it to do. I think it's important to recognize that even though you failed, you can still learn things. So, like, Conduit was a failure, plain and simple. I still occasionally get people messaging me about it saying, oh, when are you going to update it? I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> not happening. <laughs> um, 
Mm. And I'll be like, oh, my friend is writing something similar. I'll let you know when it comes out. Yada, yada, yada. Um, but from writing Conduit, I there were some features in it that were really quite good. I quite liked them. And so I've like recycled those and put them into my newer work. And I've like, I learned a lot. The part, a big thing with Conduit was I learned a lot with like formatting. I think it was a big form step in step up in formatting for me. I really liked how Conduit looked. Mm-hmm. And so I've taken that as well and push pu- put that forward into all my newer works. I've realized that maybe forcing the DM to make eight to twelve saving throws every single on every single one of your turns is not the best idea. And I've carried that forward into all of my future <laughs> works. Um and so learning from failure is a big thing. And also like recognizing that sometimes it's just maybe not gonna work out. May it, like a good idea is great, but you kind of have to get it down as well. It's, having the idea is half the battle. Um, one idea that I had that didn't see the light of day was I wanted to write topically appropriate a uh, pandemic ranger, <laughs> hmm. and I my idea for this ranger was that when it hit anyone with an attack, it would like put like a disease stack or whatever on them, a stack of disease. And as you stack disease on creatures, it like kind of debuffed them, and it's a very similar to like exhaustion, like or that, at least that concept, where mm. the more points you get, had the kind of worse you were, the worse you were off. And it was just as I kind of thought about it and thought about it, I was like, this is just going to be so annoying to track. Who has how many stacks? What that means for them? Yada yada yada. You're doing this all across different creatures, and it was just, I kind of took a step back from it one afternoon when I was trying to write it and I was like, you know what? I don't think this is going to work out. I don't think this ranger is good. I don't think I can salvage it. I don't think, cause I'm too invested in this idea of having like the disease stacking counters. And I want to come back to being coming invested in ideas. Um, but I was too invested and I was like, you know what? I don't think I can retool. Like, I don't think I can do anything with this. So I'm just going to, sh- I'm going to shelf it. And I'm going to leave it there. And then probably a year later, I was looking through all my old work, which I like to do, and I saw it. I was like, you know what? I'm going to revisit this, but I'm going to do it completely differently. And what I wrote instead was my Spirit Blossom Ranger, which had the idea of you kind of stacking a buff on a creature, but it was one creature. It didn't have any like side effects. It was just like stack buff, big burst of damage once you fully stack it. Repeat. And I'm way happy with that approach because it still kind of fulfills mechanically the same idea that I wanted, but it does it in a much easier way. It's way easier to track. It doesn't like put a bunch of stress on the DM to remember like how much each disease stack means. And so I think that that was a good lesson for me in learning that sometimes something doesn't work out, but you can take it, throw it into something else. And one thing I touched on that I want to bounce back to is becoming too invested. I think a big problem I see in homebrewing and like I've, I've, I've done this before, absolutely, is you become too attached to an idea and you refuse to let it go. Well, like I've seen a homebrew where someone was trying to make like at second level an aura where you, you could turn all you and your friends invisible at second level. <laughs> and I was, I was, I like, I don't normally comment on homebrew, but I said, I was like, I don't think that's feasible as a mechanic at second level. I don't think that, I don't think you can make that work in any way. And they refused they refuse. They're like, no, I could, it's fine. It's fine. I can make it work. It'll. I'll make it work out. And I was just like, I just don't think it's going to happen, mate. Like, AOE invisibility at second level? You're kidding yourself. Um, and it's like that was an example of someone just becoming way too attached to a mechanic. And, like, it's great that the, he had that idea. And, like, it is a cool idea, or like an aura of invisibility. But, like, at second level? I don't know. Mm. Um <laughs> And so de- definitely being able to recognize maybe when you're a bit too attached, like you, you know, it's like, well, maybe this isn't, maybe this one's not going to work out. I like this feature, but maybe it's not going to work out. I think that's an important thing to be able to recognize in your own work because it'll save you a lot of trouble when you're trying to get feedback. <laughs> yeah. And that definitely feels like one of the biggest pitfalls of homebrewing is just spending months potentially stuck on this one idea that you just think if you work at it long enough you can make it like fit perfectly but the piece just does not fit (laughs) Mm, exactly i have a bit of a rule for myself where i say if i 
like I'm trying to write a feature and I can't figure out how it's going to work or how I want it to work in like, I say a week, usually I do a week to two weeks. If it's a subclass, I'll probably give myself a week. If it's a class, I'll give myself two weeks. And if I can't figure it out by then, I drop it. I'm like, you know what? Done. Scrapped. Bin. Let's just think of something new because this isn't, this isn't working. It's a good like, rule. Think, that's just something I do for myself. I'm not, I'm not saying that everyone has to suddenly begin dropping features after a week. That's the rule. <laughs> it's the like the num the secret tip to make your, all your homebrew better. But like, it's yeah. something I just do for myself to make sure that I'm producing at a standard that I'm happy with. Because otherwise, my standards slip, and then I'll be sad, and the people that read my homebrew will be sad, and everyone will be sad, and I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> no, hundred percent. And I think that yeah, like you were saying earlier, being able to like be involved in the community to the extent that you know that this idea would be better suited for this person. Like I think it's kind of brave almost to be able to share ideas like that because it feels like so many people within the community get like uh, really attached to like the, I'm trying to think how I word this, like, um, like the, the idea that because they wrote something, it's theirs almost. Yeah, like there's a real fear like I had of this idea. sharing. I had this ideas. idea first. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, like uh, actually, that's something that I struggled with early on when I was running Dragon Knight. Any time I saw like any other like dragon based class, I was like, "How dare they take my idea? That was my idea first. <laughs> I did it better." Yada yada yada. <laughs> and I mean, obviously, if someone's gonna write like a word for word copy, I'm gonna be like, "Um, like, come on, like, at least credit me, like." But, like, there's so many of these ideas that people have are such common, like, tropes, really. Mm. No, like, no idea is truly original. And so I think, like, just because you see maybe a class, like a dancer class, I'll come back to the dancer class example. Mm. Like, and you think, oh, that's cool. I want to do it a bit differently. You can absolutely do that. And I actually even would encourage you to read that dancer class, see what you like about it, see what you don't like about it, and evolve off that. As long as you're making sure that you're, like, crediting where credit is due. It's a big thing, making sure that you're saying, oh, like, this is kind of, like, inspired by, based off, yada, 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 this dancer class, and then obviously making sure it's, like, at least a little bit original, but... Because you don't want to, like, try and take someone else's work and pass it off as your own, but you do want to... I think, like, investigating your competition is a way I'll say it, even it's Unearthed Arcana, it's hardly competition, but <laughs> I think, like, investigating your competition is, like, good. It's a good thing to do. Yeah. I mean, like when I was working on um, my summoner class, um, I ended up rooting through like all of Unearthed Arcana, um, several different brews on DM's Guild I actually purchased, all to like gather the, the information of, okay, what exists out there? What from these brews is really cool that I could like use in my own work and mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. sort of piecemeal gather all the best parts of everything. Uh, to yeah, just see what see what you like. Mm. Exactly. No, absolutely. I think that's a really, I think that's a really good thing to get into the habit of doing. Yeah, it can be really inspirational, and I think like people get far too hung up on the idea that like everything has to be like there can only be one version of a brew, for example. <laughs> exactly. It's like there are so many because I wrote like I wrote the Titan class. And there are so many Defender classes out there. Like, if you looked up, like, oh, maybe it's like one called, there's probably one called, like, the Warden, there's probably one called, like, the Bastion, there's probably one called the Juggernaut. Mm -hmm. And they're all just different takes on the same idea. Admittedly, with Titan, I didn't look at a lot of, I don't think I looked at any de other Defender classes when I wrote it, but that was mostly just because I already kind of knew what I wanted from it. So I kind of skipped the whole, like, development phase. I just went straight to, like, this is exactly what it is. Um... <laughs> But I think if you're like, if you're stuck, go and look at other stuff. Go and look at like, even like, even if you're writing a class, go look at a subclass, go look at a spell even that covers kind of what you're doing. And I find even like looking at like art can help me brew. Like if I'm like, oh, I want to write, maybe I want to write like a jungle ranger. I'm going to go look at artwork of jungles and just see if anything like inspires me. If I see anything and go, ah, that's it. That's what I want. That's what I want my sub subclass to feel like. Hmm. Yeah, you're not the first guest to say that like artwork is inspiring for them. Like I think Genuine um had most of his ideas from like looking at Magic the Gathering card artwork. Gosh, Magic the Gathering card artwork is so good. Mm. I don't use it a lot because I really like very like bold colors. 
in when I'm like um, picking artwork. Mm-hmm. And also I don't beholden myself to just picking Wizards of the Coast artwork because I feel like my work would suffer if I did that. Just like <laughs> that's just a pers- that's just a personal thing. For sure. Absolutely not not to discredit Wizards of the Coast artworks at all. I think their work is fantastic. But I just love like really bold colours and really like bright images and like really like sharp lines. Um and so actually that's one of the big reasons to segue. It's one of the big reasons I don't have like a Patreon or anything is because if I did, I wouldn't be able to use all this. I mean, I'm still basically stealing artwork and still very much a gray area, but <laughs> um, like if I was to use a Patreon, like have a Patreon and then I was to like also use artwork that I was found online, like that would be a, a bit sketchy. Like that would be a bit, a bit sketchy. Mm. And so by not having a Patreon, I'm not like, I may be using this artwork, but I'm not profiting off it in any way. Um, and that helps me sleep at night. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. And like making an effort where you can to like cite at least the artists and the stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. People need to be citing artists. Um, even still sometimes on IUA, I see people that don't cite the artists or like they put it like the very corner in very like unseeable text. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Yeah, like you can spend um, three weeks like writing all of this class documentation, but you couldn't take the two minutes it takes to stick a little bit at the end with just the art citation. <laughs> exactly. There was actually a period of time where I, my Relentless Storm Warlock patron, there was an artwork I really, really, really wanted to use for that piece. Mm. And I knew the artist, but they never uploaded it to like their, their site. And I was waiting probably for like six months to, for them to upload it. Never happened. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to have to find something else because this sucks. But Because I really like that art. But unfortunately, they never uploaded it. And I'm like, if they ha- haven't uploaded it, I feel like I can't credit them properly. Mm. And I refuse to post this if I can't credit the artist properly. And so I kind of had to move on. And I found something that I love just as much. So it all worked out in the end. But. Yeah, like I had that, I had that subclass ready to post for like six months. I was just waiting for this artist to finally post their art credits, and it never happened. <laughs> oh, such a shame, and it can be real frustrating if you have like that one piece of artwork that is like the inspiration for uh, like a particular piece of work that you can't really put together with it. Mm, no, absolutely. I really do love a lot of like kind of cyberpunk sci-fi artworks but unfortunately D D is a fantasy game and so whenever <laughs> i'm like finally get around to the point where it's like okay i need to put artwork to this brew i have all like these inspiration pieces i'm like i can't use any of these <laughs> um there was one subclass i wrote i think it was my variant shadow sorcerer where the it's a character from a video game his name's omen and in the actual artwork he's holding like a, a rifle and I was talking to my my like some of my friends about it. I was like, maybe if I just like post him with the rifle and say it's his spellcasting focus, everyone's like, nah, Blake, maybe not. <laughs> maybe find something else. And I was like, no, but I love it so much. So I ended up photoshopping the image, and I think I like cut out one of his arms and like duplicated it on the other side and like adjust like the lighting a little bit, mm. so it looked like he just had kind of two arms. I think it was like holding knives. And I'm like, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. I mean, I have a huge collection of homebrew, um, and I will say that I have come across like some pretty brazen uh, attempts to like stretch the genre. Like, uh, yeah, there's an Arcanatron race out there that's pretty much just like super sci-fi androids from another dimension, oh, that's, that's and there was so a, an explosion that sent them into all the other dimensions, and that's how they ended up in D anD. D. That is very brazen. It's a very good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, that is funny as. And at the end of the day, though, like that's like if I was playing the game and someone rocked up with their like, this is my robot character, I'd mm. be like, what the hell? Like, what is that? <laughs> like, come on, we're playing a fantasy game. But like out there somewhere, there's going to be like tables where people like don't care. They're like, great, cool, come join us. We'll play D and D, and it's like great that that content exists for them. Yeah, yeah. Because at the end of the day, like we can like sit here and talk about, oh, perfect balance for homebrews as much as we want. But as long as people are having fun, that's what matters, really. 100%. Which is the big, that's like the big driving force for when I write homebrew is like, is this fun? 
Sometimes that question ends with, is this fun for me? Because some of the homebrew I write is very self-serving. Mm. And I'm like, I want to write something that I want to play, so I'm going to write it that way. And then people will be comment and be like, this is really weird. I'll be like, yeah, but I like it, so shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but I think making sure that uh, like I'm writing content that people can enjoy is absolutely the biggest driving force for me. And sometimes it sucks when I write something that I'm really proud of and it like it kind of bombs on a Nuts Arcana. Like it might only get like 20, 30 upvotes. And I'll be like, damn, that sucks. But then like I, I'll still get like a couple of comments where people will say, oh, I love this. I can't wait to play it. Or like, oh, this is really cool. Like I might like try and retool this into something that I might write. And I'm like, that's awesome. And so even like when I have those days where it's like, ah, oh, this thing I wrote didn't do too hot. It's like nice to know that there's still people out there that are still enjoying my work. So I was just thinking, um, since you're working about a Patreon, um, is there like no way for people to support you? Like, are you not interested in trying to monetize your work in any way? No, I'm not. Um, interestingly, uh, I have no desire to monetize my work. And the big reason for that, is, in addition to like the art is part of that, being able to like use art that I like to like that, because looking for art is like a really enjoyable thing for me. And I want to be able to continue enjoying to do that. But the biggest reason actually that I don't have, I don't like charge money for my work, don't have a Patreon, don't even have a Kofi, is that I like being able to work at my own pace and I like being able to work for me. Hmm. And what I mean by that is if I feel like if I was to start a Patreon or even a Kofi, I would, I feel like I would be indebted to write homebrew because it no longer would become a hobby. It would become a job. I see. And that would that would kind of kill it for me a little bit if I was to suddenly make money off my homebrew because then I would I feel like I'd I feel like I would have to like start saying, "Oh, if you're a Patreon, you can like vote on what I'm going to write next." And I would hate that because I like writing what I want to write. And yeah. so that's probably the biggest reason I don't have a Patreon is is that that I like being able to work for me. Also, sometimes I just want to break from homebrewing. I might just decide, you know what? I'm not going to write homebrew for the next two months. I've got stuff going on. Not really in the mood. Kind of falling out of the hobby a little bit, which happens from to me from time to time. And if I had a Patreon, like I can't just suddenly be like, "Hey guys, I'm not writing stuff. <laughs> keep keep that money flowing, though." <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's kind of why I don't have like a Patreon or anything like that. Yeah, it makes sense. And I mean, we have heard that story from like Mike from uh, Machan Press that like. Once he turned his homebrew into like a business, like he ended up becoming a business owner, not a homebrewer. <laughs> like he barely gets mm. to write anything now. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I would like, I would hate it if that happened to me. And like, I really do admire people that are able to like turn their homebrew into like something really successful, like genuine, like even like kibbles. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I just don't think that's, that's not something that I'm interested in pursuing for myself. Yeah, I think that's totally admirable because, like, I think a lot of people end up getting lost in kind of the idealization of of homebrew becoming their profession. Mm. And I think that there's probably even better ways to go about it if that is your goal. Because, I mean, we've heard from so many different people now, like, Genuine started with his um, self-publishing, um, and which he kind of operates at a loss at some times. Mm. And things like that, where you are doing it as like your own little business can be like a point for like your CV maybe, like, but you still have to pursue industry jobs, I suppose, in that sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's definitely not something, or I think it would be very rare that someone like solely lives off homebrewing. I'm sure that there's someone out there that is like making an absolute killing, Um, but definitely probably a one in a million kind of situation. Yeah, there's definitely a certain alignment of the stars you need to happen. <laughs> like, Absolutely. Uh, how many people are there on DMs Guild besides Benjamin Hoffman that have that kind of like notoriety and like fan following? <laughs> like, mm, absolutely, absolutely. Actually, one thing I will say: this is a this might be a little bit controversial. One mm. thing I will say, and I will preface this by saying that I have friends who like do use like DMs Guild, Patreon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And make money off their homebrew, and I love them to bits. But sometimes I do feel like there is almost a bit of like a stigma that because like my work or other people who don't have Patreons and or use DMs Guild and stuff like that, because 
we don't charge money for our work. Our work is inherently worse. Mm. Almost. And some, like, a lot of the time it's not, like, intended. It's not meant. Like, people don't mean it. But it feels almost implied that because because I choose not to have a Patreon or charge money for my work, my work is less good. That sounds awful. Less. <laughs> I'm going to stick with it. Less good. Um, yeah, own it. <laughs> um, but, no, I understand what you mean. Like, And it's something, it's like this weird fallacy that people run into, like, and even within like the DMs Guild itself, you obviously have like the paid work and pay as you feel with like yeah. suggested amounts. And it almost does feel like there's an inherent bias there. <laughs> and like you would hope that work you pay for is, oh, like you would hope that so- if you're paying for something, you would hope that its quality is better than that of something you would find um, for free. But like, that's not always the case. And, like, I've seen plenty of things on DMs Guild that I go, like, really? This much? For this? Mm. Um, and it just kind of sucks as someone who, like, does write free content that I f- sometimes I feel like my work is looked down on or, like, I'm not as impressive as, like, a homebrewer because I just, just because I don't make a buck off my homebrew. Um, and that can, that can suck sometimes. Yeah, and I feel like... The idea of making some work like pay as you feel is kind of good in in theory, but I feel like in practice, in a marketplace where there are things with set prices, it creates this weird clash. Because like, yeah, people are inherently going to feel like, oh, if I can choose to pay for it, then I might like go back and pay for it later. Um, or like maybe this like to the, un- maybe not the uninitiated, but to people who don't have as much experience with like judging homebrew of like its quality, mm. it gives the impression that this is not going to be worth as much as something that you would pay for with a set price. Like, mm. Mm. Absolutely. Honestly, I feel like whenever I see something that's pay as like, pay as like pay whatever you want, it's I almost feel like it's like a bit of a guilt trip. It's mm. like you can pay whatever you want, but if you pay zero, I'll be really sad. <laughs> <laughs> Hundred percent. I'm just thinking. Do you know um, the Itchio community? Ah, uh, it rings a bell, but I oh, I feel like I've heard of it. It's all good. I mean, I definitely want to talk to more creators from there because, like, there is this like weird big divide between D and D and everything else in the tabletop RPG world, mm-hmm. and I think that also kind of that divide goes through the homebrew community as well. Because, like, I mean, there's so many people out there making just like full games which aren't D D, and these things are coming out like every week every month and these creators obviously have a lot to share with the world um and i feel like if we could bring the communities together like we'd only benefit from it absolutely because like even like when i'm like getting feedback on something i, I kind of carry on with what you're saying is like when i'm trying to get feedback on my work i want to make sure that i'm talking to as many different people as possible because if I just talk to one person, they tell me something's broken, and then like that's it, then that doesn't help me. Not really. If I like if I talk to five or even ten people and suddenly like one person tells me something's broken, but everyone else says, Oh no, that's probably fine the way it is. It's probably more likely that it's fine the way it is. And so I think making sure that you're opening yourself up to feedback from lots of different people, even people you know you're going to disagree with, is really important. Cause Especially when I was early on, when I was homebrewing, there were people I would say, "Hey, can you can you do can you have a look at this for me?" And even as I was sending them my work, I knew that I would probably disagree with every single thing that they said about my work. <laughs> they would say like, "This is broken. Don't like how you designed this. I disagree entirely with this design philosophy." And I would be like, "No, shut up. You're on. Go away." Not I wouldn't <laughs> say that, but like that would basically be the extent of our conversation. But what mm. I found really useful with that is that the times when they said something and I was like, I kind of paused and I was like, Oh, I actually think you have a point. You know, I think you're onto something here. I think maybe that you're right in that this isn't quite what it should be. Mm. And so make even making sure that you're talking to people that you don't even agree with about your work is super important. Um, and to kind of link that back with what you were saying about making sure we have lots of different creators in our community and we'll only benefit. We will only benefit. Because, like, having more voices is always great. Having 
more people with lots of different experiences is great for any community. Yeah, absolutely. Like the the globalism kind of perspective. <laughs> Multicultural homebrewing community. That's what I want to see. Hell yeah. Let's do it on Earth Arcana. Woot woot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I had a, a thought a second ago, and it just kind of fluttered away. <laughs> oh, that's my life. Oh, my goodness. Just a head full of butterflies. Yeah. Me in a nutshell. <laughs> oh, that was it. Yeah. So I think, like, there's a weird thing in D&D, um, maybe more so amongst, like, the grognards of the community, um, mm-hmm. about keeping, like, the design ethos of fifth edition pure <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like i find the main problem i have with a lot of my brews is that i end up designing with too much of a third edition kind of ideology where like things get very granular and expansive and there's like too much content whereas obviously the design paradigms of fifth edition is about simplification and minimal minimalism yeah yeah um so what do I think about that? Okay, this is coming from someone who has... I have never played any other edition of Dungeons & Dragons. I've mm. only played 5th edition. I have played other systems, namely Lancer, which is like a like a mech fighting kind of system, and a Wrath and Glory I've tried a little bit of. Mm-hmm. Um, and while I appreciate Dungeons & Dragons for its simplicity, uh, I think that there's something to be gained from having options that are more expansive, having options that allow for more uh, flexibility, customization, as seen in the exemplar class that I wrote. I really wanted to make sure I was writing a martial class that gave you options, let you have lots of different things that you could do on a day-to-day basis. Um, And even, like, other systems, like Lancer has a system, like, part of Lancer's design is that certain things will just, like, features will say, while in combat, X, Y, Z. And oh my gosh, writing things for 5th edition would be so much easier if that was part of its design. If there was like a clause <laughs> that says, while in combat, no longer would I have to be like, for one minute, it's just like, no, while you're in combat, you can teleport. Because suddenly it's not broken. Suddenly you can't teleport through doors out of combat. Mm. Uh, um, but yeah, I think there's, there is something to be gained from making sure that, like, you know, you're sticking to typical 5th uh, edition kind of like standards because obviously you I mean I don't think you want to rock the boat too much right because otherwise it's suddenly it's like what am I even looking at like this is almost a completely different game mm. other side of the coin though if like if we're just sticking exactly to what fifth edition says why are we even homebrewing at all isn't the point of homebrewing to like push the boundaries a little bit make like making new things making exciting things um, for sure and so while it's, I think it's important to keep in mind what what fifth edition stands for is probably the easiest way to stay, say it. I think it, I think it's important that as homebrewers we're pushing the boundaries, we're like testing the limits of the system. Um, because I feel like that's how we're going to make the most interesting content. For sure, and I think like that was something that was really playing on my mind when I was thinking about like what I was saying with itchio community being brought in. It kind of plays into that same thing of like well. I think there's a trope in the larger TTRPG community that people who play Dungeons and Dragons rarely end up playing anything else. <laughs> mm, I would probably say that that's true, even with my limited experience with like TTRPGs, because realistically, I've only probably been playing for about, it's been kind of on and off since I started, so probably only like four years, mm. maybe less, of Dungeons and Dragons. Because um, I, am, I am actually fairly young, I think, in comparison to a lot of my peers. Mm-hmm. And it is weird thinking of people like Genuine and like Le- uh, Leonette, now it goes by Steve, and all of those like more commonly known known household name homebrewers as like my peers. These goddamn but boomers. They're boomers, <laughs> am I right? Freaking boomers in our community. I can't even believe it. Um, <laughs> I'm, gonna have to, I'm actually going to start calling them that <laughs> when I next talk to them. Um, oh, no. But yeah, like when I'm talking to these boomers, it's like, they're now my peers and that's like a really weird thing to think about is because when I, I mean, when I first started homebrewing, I was like looking up to these people and now I'm like, they're like complimenting me on my work and telling me things that they like about what I, what I do. 
Mm. And that's crazy to me because these people must be like so much older than me. I'm only 21. Like, <laughs> I've still got so much to go. I've still got so much to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm 33 and I didn't start playing any other tabletop games than D&D until like maybe five or six years into playing it. And that was mostly because when you went to the game stores, obviously there's the TTRPG section and amongst the D&D books, you had all these other games that kind of caught my eye. But I certainly yeah, don't absolutely. feel like anything in the D&D community ever spurred me to want to play anything else. Mm. No, I think branching out to other other systems is, especially as a home brewer, is only good. Mm. It only serves you well to branch out. Because, like, when I played Lancer, overall, I played, like, like kind of like a mini campaign of Lancer, and I decided that I wasn't the biggest fan of the system, but since playing it, I have taken so many ideas and adapted that into my homebrew. <laughs> like, so many concepts from that game, I've just pinched and gone, yeah, like, that's fantastic, I love how they've done this, and I'm going to do that in something. Or, like, oh, this is so cool, I love this whole entire, like, theme they've got going on, I'm going to see if I can use that in something I write. And so... Yeah, I think branching out and like, trying other systems, trying e- even other games, like not even necessarily role-playing games, like board games, video games. There's like so yeah. much that can be learned from their design. Yeah, I think it was, um, maybe it was Angry I was talking to. Um, he brought up like uh, Hollow Knight game design information as part of like discussing how to make exploration in D&D better. Like, mm. And I come from like a video game design background um, before I had, had an interest in tabletop RPGs. And that's definitely helped me a lot, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely would. Yeah, I think that the within the community, there is definitely, I mean, always going to be those purists who say that, well, this is straying too far from what D&D is. <laughs> when you try and incorporate like design ideas from other realms. And maybe that yeah, is absolutely. part of the divide between the d d community and the rest of the uh, world of brewing. Yeah, maybe. And at the end of the day, it's like, if you don't like something, just don't use it. Like, mm. it's that simple. Like, I've had people message me saying, like, oh, I think your Dragon Knight class is crap and I hate it and it's awful. And I'm like, that's nice. I'm, like, I'm glad you feel about the, like it like that because, honestly, I'm not expecting everyone to like it. Like, first of all, it's, a, like, you get a dragon. That's already a fairly, like, a, like contentious thing, especially in, like, <laughs> the Forgotten Realms setting where dragons are so, like, powerful. Mm. Um, And so not everyone's going to like stuff that I make or you make or anyone makes. And I think that's understanding that. Sometimes you're just not going to... some Things you write aren't going to appeal to everyone. And I think understanding that is really important. And understanding that, like, I'm writing something... This person might not like it, and that's fine, because they do, they just won't use it, right? Yeah, hundred percent. I think I was watching something by Matthew Colville a while back, and he brought up that in first edition D anD D, even Gygax left like a footnote to say that if someone wants to play a dragon, like you can let them do that. Like it doesn't have to be the same stats as what's in the monster manual, but you can let them play out any fantasy they want. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, I think one thing that interests me is that you are a homebrew who has never DM'd. Is that right? <laughs> yes, I have never DM'd. Okay, no, not true. I've run like two one-shots. So I I feel like that doesn't count, right? I feel like everyone's like ran a one-shot once in their life. Like, oh, family members who are interested in D&D, let me run a one-shot, you know? Um, no, I mean, I think that counts. Like, <laughs> I mean, you got to start somewhere, right? See, but I ha- I don't have any interest in running a game, like running a campaign. Like, it doesn't interest me. And one thing I find interesting is the way that affects my work. Because very often, I'm not sure if it's for the better, or for, for better or for worse. I'm still trying to figure that out. But a lot of the times, biggest example is I will write a feature and everyone I show it to who are, because I would say that by and large, a lot of, um, homebrewers like run campaigns mm. and I will show it to some, like my friends and I'll be like hey what do we all think of this and they all go this would be a nightmare for a DM to handle <laughs> this feature would be so annoying to do a deal with as a DM 
And I go, oh, wait, really? Re- like, yeah. And they're like, oh, my gosh, Blake, could you even imagine? I'm like, not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, yeah, like, because I once wrote a feature for a uh, barbarian. I've yet to, I don't think I've released it because the artist hasn't released the artwork. Please, artist, post the artwork. Um, <laughs> I'm too attached to this one artwork. But I have this one barbarian. And they have a feature where they had a feature where, like, you could, like, sacrifice a body and perform, a, like, a ritual with, like, a corpse. Mm. And you would, like, create this area of effect and, like, a one-mile radius around you that would, like, affect creatures. And it was a part of it, I think, that, like, gave every creature in the area, like, disadvantage on, like, certain checks. And all the people I would show that to were like, that's that would be so annoying. That would be so inconvenient to handle. <laughs> <laughs> as a dungeon master and i'm like oh maybe you're right I, initially i was like nah it's fine i think it's i think it's great and then like a day later i was like you know what maybe it is a bit much um so in some ways me not like running long-standing campaigns probably doesn't serve me well but on the other hand i feel like in relation to um players who do dungeon master i'm able to much better focus on what would a player enjoy as a player because I'm someone that only plays Dungeons and Dragons, like as a player. So I'm always in like the seat. I'm always in the mindset of like, would a player enjoy this? I'm never really thinking about like from the DMs, from like the DMs perspective. I'm always like, is this fun for the player? Is this engaging for the player? Is this fun for the other players at the table? And that kind of stuff, hmm. which has helped me in some ways, right? Because Dragon Knight, for example, is a class where you're running two characters and that's nuts. Um, But I felt like because of my experience as someone who plays as a player and not like as a dungeon master because a dungeon master is having to run lots of different monsters as a time all the time but as a because i'm always playing i'm having to think okay what's the best way for that a player would handle this like if i was a player what's the best way i can i can like manage this kind of class without kind of having to go oh my gosh seven monsters at once this is so you sh- this is so easy for me to figure out <laughs> it's so easy for me to run seven monsters at once and that instead, I was like, "Oh, this is a this is a challenge I have to overcome." But I ov- overcame it. Dragonite is fine; it's it's okay. <laughs> and mm. then, and I think that it's it's come out really well because I was forced to think about how it played from a player's perspective. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think how like every brewer obviously comes from a different perspective. So like whether they're brewing as a DM or as a player or even as someone who doesn't necessarily play very often. One of those little things that contributes to making their work unique. Though I feel like we have very different, um, maybe what's the word? Like <laughs> approaches? No, um, different like standards on complexity. <laughs> standards on complexity. Because like, I mean, when you were talking about um, the idea of having like to manage like more than one creature as being like a big deal in fifth edition. And I think that's fair mm-hmm. to say, like, I mean, you probably only have like the ranger that really has a pet, maybe the druid now with like alternate class features. Yeah. Back when I first started my campaign with my players, one of my players was playing a class called the dread necromancer. Um, oh dear. I can see where this is going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like the whole class you can kind of focus it in three different directions. One of them being a controller. So like having a harem of <laughs> undead. A harem of undead. undead. Yeah. Oh, that's too funny. And yeah, it got to the point where we'd end up saying, okay, well, Nadia, it's your turn. Uh, everyone take a break while she figures out what she's doing with her 17 undead. <laughs> yeah. Can be a bit like that, especially with summons. Oh, conjure animals. Don't even get me started. But, um... <laughs> Your DM will have the stats. Oh, will they? <laughs> oh, gosh. Whenever I see anything that's like DM fiat, I'm like, this is, I hate it. Yeah. Anytime I see a feature that's like the DM determines what happens, I'm like, get me off this ride. <laughs> <laughs> Do not want to be involved. Mm. Um, but yeah, so that, I mean, that's something I try to avoid in my homebrew is like DM fiat. I try to make sure that like the DM doesn't have, not doesn't like have a say over what you do because that's not quite what I mean. But I want to make sure I'm not. I don't want to put work on the DM to make your class or subclass function, right? Yeah. It's like Wild Magic Sorcerer. It's like, oh, it, you can surge when your DM remembers to let you surge. 
it's like, who who wrote this? Who, like, wrote those words in the player's handbook and went, ah, tick, great. Yeah, and that's, like, one of two subclasses. <laughs> For Sorcerer, yeah. It's, like, my, probably my favourite subclass is Wild Magic Sorcerer. I adore it, and I have played it so much. But the second I go to play one, I turn to my DM, and I am just tell them, I'm like, Where's, I'm ignoring that text. I am going to surge without fail every single time after I use Tides of Chaos. On the, whenever I use Tides of Chaos, next spell cast, I surge. That's it. You don't get to pick. And they're like, half the time they're like, no. And I'm like, great, I'm not playing it then. And mm-hmm. I'll play something else. And other times they're like, sure, that's fine. And I'm like, great. And less work for you. I get to use my cool feature more often. Everyone wins. Um, but yeah, so I think having features where the DM kind of set, has to like poke their head in and be like, oh, here's my, here's my, how I think of this or here's my like, let me flip up those creature stat blocks for you is always a bit uh, questionable. That's just why I don't put it in my homebrew and whenever I see it in other people's homebrews, I'm always a bit like, I don't know about that. Yeah, I mean, it's really just introducing ways to slow down the game. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think making sure the game runs smoothly and quickly is definitely important. Yeah, there's a good uh, brew by Circle called the uh, Alternative Sorcerer. Yeah, Tweak Sorcerer. Yep. That's the one, yeah. Uh, They have the Raw Magic subclass, which is... uh, What is the Sorcerer that does the Wild Magic? The Wild Magic Sorcerer. That would be it. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the wild. They didn't even have. They didn't even think up of a cool name. They're like, it does wild magic. So I guess we'll just call it the wild magic sorcerer. <laughs> yeah. Well, the raw magic sorcerer is the wild magic one, but the player has con- more control over the craziness. Like you invoke the chaos in order to get effects. Yeah, definitely. I have seen the raw magic sorcerer, and there's some things I've read it ages ago. There was like. <laughs> would have been like when it like first came out. I was some things where I was like, I don't know about this, but by and large, I did really like that change because I think making sure that players have agency is really important, mm. both over their features in the game, like how their characters like act, how their characters think. Really, really important because you hear these horror stories of like play games where players are like doing something with their character, and the DM just goes, ah, actually no, that's not how that works. Your character dies or whatever. Like, wait, her hand waves that kind of crap and you're like, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> like, what kind of psycho does that? People <laughs> mad with power. <laughs> exactly. And so I think making sure that players have agency is really important. Because um, if players don't have agency, then, like, what's the point of playing the game? Because, like, if a, if a player can't even choose what their character does at any given moment, mm. like, why are you playing D&D? Because that's what, that's what it's all about, really. It's like the DM is setting up a narrative and the players are playing in it. And if the DM wants like to control the players in a certain way, they may as well just go like write a novel. Yeah, yeah. And I think I've mentioned before that like that was the downfall of the last campaign that I ran, um, where it was just running into the situation that I had pretty much already figured out like where I wanted them to be at different points. And if they weren't there, I was just kind of using the DM control of everything to make sure that they ended up in places like Mm. having them kidnapped Mm. and brought to X location. (laughs) Like, yeah, no, no, the players just need to have like meaningful choices. Absolutely. Meaningful choices are really important. Um, one thing I love as a player is dying. This Mm. might be a controversial take, but I love it when a character dies, adore it, addicted to it even because it, it creates a cool moment because everyone remembers the moment that a character dies. Yeah. And I'm not saying that DMs out there should go around killing off players one by one. <laughs> no, of course. But if I'm ever like in a combat and I feel like the DM's pulling at their punches or like they're like deliberately trying not to kill us even though the enemies we're up against wouldn't care if we died, I'm always just a bit like, well, this kind of sucks. Because mm. now I, it's like, what am I like? There's no threat. This isn't even dangerous. Like, this just kind of feels like a combat that takes us to the next combat that's probably going to be the same. And then after that, we might have a combat that's actually threatening. But I think making sure that um, your players are challenged, meaningfully challenged in games, and making sure they have agency, two big things. I have a lot of opinions about how Dungeon Masters should run game 
run games as someone who is not DM'd very often. Um, maybe I should be a dungeon master. Um, but I think making sure that your players have agency and making sure that your players are meaningfully challenged and not even necessarily in combat. You can do that through puzzles. You can have like role player challenges where maybe there's like an NPC they ha- they can't fight. They have to converse with, and it's hard to kind of get, maybe get through that NPC or argue with that NPC because if you're not challenged, if like if everything you do is a pushover, why? You know, like, why do I have all these cool features if ever if we're only ever fighting goblins and they die to warm up my one longbow shot? Like, what's the point? <laughs> if I feel like I if I feel like I have plot armor, or if like the DM is pulling their punches, or if like things are not happening the way not the way I imagine they happen, but like if like a wolf is like bearing down on me, gets me to zero hit points, and like doesn't like eat me if i'm like the only one left i'm like what is this Mm. (laughs) it just it just really like it rips me out of the game i get like really like jarred by it exactly Um, yeah it kind of falls into that situation where you're like well if what i'm doing has no real impact i'm not really playing a game i'm just pretending to play a game (laughs) like yeah it's like nothing i do matters in this game mm. because my actions don't have consequences um and that's not to say that, like, DMs should go around killing every, like, killing a, like, have, oh. like, a kill quota. Like, no, every five course. sessions, one player must die. Um, mm. Or even, like, you can, like, players should, can and should be sad when their characters die. Absolutely. I've been sad when my characters die, even when I've been rooting for them to die, almost. Yeah. But it's about, like, taking the time to be like, oh, that kind of sucks. I enjoyed that character. Taking the time to like, process that and then going, okay, but what am I going to play now? Like what's next for me? What do I what do I get to play next? Mm. And often you'll find that players like get so excited by the idea of like what will I play next? Um and it can just be a scary thing because play like we as players we can get so attached to our characters, especially if we've been playing them for like really long times. Like right now I'm playing a tiefling exemplar. Was a was a bard, a valor bard, but I swapped him over to an exemplar. Um, cause I liked him and I, but I wanted to play something else. So I was like to my DM, I'm like, can I just like swap it around a little bit? And they're like, that's fine. Like you can do that. So an ex- tiefling exemplar. And I'm going to be really, I'm going to really gutted when he dies. Cause I, he's so much fun to play. He's got such a fun personality. He's so cool. And, but like same token when he dies, I'll get to play something new. And that's just as exciting. So in my experience, I've been running into wall after wall figuring out at what point should I stop trying to brew my way out of a situation and just play another game <laughs> mm. and for me it's been largely trying to make D&D more complex and more like it's third edition counterparts with like bits and pieces and I essentially just reached the point where I realized that I should just be playing Pathfinder <laughs> oh no <laughs> yeah that's the route that I'm going down at the moment um, but I think while I've been on that journey, I've also been concerned for my players who have been trying to simplify things and not run things as complex. And I feel like a question that I've sort of not really been realizing that I've been asking myself for their part is at what point should they be playing a different game? Like, cause we're on opposite sides of the spectrum. I'm trying to make it more complex. They're trying to simplify things and streamline it and make it more narrative focused mm-hmm. and for me, D and D in itself has always been a complex game, and it felt antithetical. Um, so I feel like we've all been trying to ex- experiment with trying other games and find what really fits our play styles, uh, or even our GMing styles. Is a better way to put it. That's a good question. I think a big part of that is definitely f- making sure that you find a group that suits your play style. And not even necessarily like that you all agree on how the game should be played. Because like I've my current group, I'm probably the only person in that group that is like advocating for like DM, please kill all of us off, please. Um, <laughs> but I'm able to compromise right with the other players because we all want to play D and D. None of us want to like none of none of my group want to go play like a different system. I don't. I certainly don't. I love Dungeons and Dragons. Hmm. And so for us, it's about compromising. One struggle I had with one of my groups was the dungeon master loved rolling for stats, adored it. I 
despise it. I hate rolling for stats. <laughs> I'm, I hate it when I roll and I get like only everything's below a 14 and it's just like that's what it is and i'm like this sucks i hate this and the dm's like no but if you do point by everyone's the same and it's boring and yada 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 <laughs> and we could not see eye to eye and so what we ended up doing after not playing dd for a while because we couldn't agree on how to make our characters um <laughs> what we did is we rolled a set of stats like a massive pool of stats enough stats so that so everyone could like have like enough sets of their characters. We put them put them all like on a slip of paper. And this was four players, six stats, been like twenty four slips of paper. Put them all in the middle. And then we went around the table and we each like took stats for our character. Okay. And we would talk us all of us players would like talk about like, oh we have an eighteen. I think you should take that because you're the wizard, right? <laughs> and we want to make sure that your spell casting ability is really high. Oh, there's two fifteen here. Or oh, you're playing a human, you take the two fifteens because they'll become sixteens for you. And that was so much fun. Mm. It was so fun doing character generate like generating like that because suddenly because sometimes I feel like creating a character can be such a solitary activity. And doing it that way, we were like we were forced to sit there and talk about like, oh, this is my plan. These are the kind of stats I'm looking for. Oh, that's your plan? Oh, that's a really good idea. If I actually play this instead, it'll be so much better. And we'll be able to like we'll be able to like combo in fights and stuff or whatever. And and that kind of like, and that all started because me and the dungeon master could not agree on how to roll stats. And so I think making sure that you're willing to compromise in those kind of situations is really important and it can lead to even better situations. And I've never gotten to roll stats like that again. And I'm really annoyed. No, I think that's a really cool idea. Like, yeah, it was so much fun. Sort of integrates the team building from the start. Absolutely. Also, there was a four. Someone rolled a four. So it was 40, <laughs> I think it was 46 dropped the highest. No, dropped the lowest. And someone still managed to get a four. Oh, <laughs> and wow. I was like, the four is mine. I will take the four. I love having low stats. <laughs> it builds character, literally. <laughs> it does build character. I think I played like a tabaxi sorcerer who had like a four and a wisdom and nine intelligence. And he was like a complete moron and I loved him. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I don't know if you ever run into this problem. Maybe not so much because you're not GMing so often. Um but I feel like a problem that I often run into is that when I have players who aren't as experienced with D&D, they're usually quite wary of homebrew. Um, mm. Like they feel like they want to get to know the base game before they want to start like playing with modified versions. Even if like I'm explicitly telling them like, no, but the tweak sorcerer isn't that different. Like it's really just quality of life improvements that you're going to appreciate even if you haven't played the base one like <laughs> yeah but yeah. they're like no 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 i just i don't want to play the the one in the book i just want to get to know it like <laughs> yeah absolutely see i always have because i have actually introduced some of my friends yeah like i have i play video games with them and i've introduced them to dungeons and dragons we're all in a campaign together mm. um, as in we're all players and one of our other friends is dungeon mastering and they've like They've seen it because they know that I write Dean D. Hober and they're like looking at some of my work and they're like, oh, I want to play this. And they're like pointing at Dragon Knight. And I'm like, I don't, I really don't think you should play Dragon Knight for your first <laughs> D&D experience. I really don't think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or they're like, they'll find this homebrew class and it like gets all these minion summons or whatever. And I'm like, they're like, please don't play that for your first thing. Like, second, fine, go ahead. L like, live it, love it. But maybe for your first experience maybe even if it's homebrew just something like let's rein it in a little bit you know mm. <laughs> no because i think there's something to be said about like wanting your players to like learn the learn the core game first before they start learning all the different supplements and then like in cases like tweak sorcerer it's not gonna matter right if they play just sorcerer tweak sorcerer we'll yeah. not make it they won't even probably won't even notice the difference but like if they're like pulling like classes out of the woodworks or even subclasses out of the woodworks that have very like complicated um design goals uh it can get a bit like maybe that's not the best idea for your first dungeons and dragons experience i don't want these turns to go on for 20 minutes <laughs> <laughs> i, I want to get through a combat in a day please yeah well i mean maybe it's just my players because again like they're very interested in like the minimalist approach um yeah but they're really wary of like having too many options like to me too many options doesn't really exist as a concept so <laughs> we, yeah, no, we really I'm, clash yeah, I'm on that boat. i mean i'm in this absolutely in the same boat uh like my exemplar class has so many options there's like oh what was the maths on it 
I'll come back to this. But like, I think options are like, I think options are great because like there may be like a thousand options out there. You're you're still only picking one. Mm. At the end of the day, you're still only like picking one option. So the fact that there's a thousand out there isn't like a huge deal. The only place where I'd say that that's may- maybe it can be a bit much is, is when you see like a class. Someone's like posting their homebrew class and it's like 30 pages. That's like <laughs> maybe maybe this one should be raided a little bit. Yeah, that's, <laughs> this, that's this me. Does seem that's, like a little... <laughs> that's every class I make. <laughs> it's just like, look, if we can get it under 20, that'd be great. Um, so the thing I was going to say about Exemplar, because with Exemplar, mm. I wanted to make a class that um, had lots of options. So at level, what is it, 13, which is when the class has like the most stuff available to it, there are, uh, what was the number? It's 33,600 different kinds of exemplars that can exist. Wow. Across all of the options. And that's not even taking in, uh, taking ability score improvements into account. That's like, <laughs> just like class features. And so I was very, I was very proud of that. I was like, ah, I've done it. <laughs> that's pretty intense. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot. And I have gotten criticism of exemplar where people say it's like, there's too much to choose from. It's too bloated. And I think that's a valid criticism. But like, like I was saying earlier, like if you don't, if you don't like it, don't play it. It's, it's like, it's that simple. Hmm. Although I will advocate against trying to make your own magic system. That is. Oh my gosh. I've seen it done once <laughs> successfully, which is, um, Comet, uh, Ky- I never know what to call him. I'll call him Kaim. Kaim's oh, astrologer. Fine. And even with Kaim's astrologer, I love, I love Kaim. I think it's a fantastic balance. But even his astrologer just makes me go a little bit hmm. <laughs> like it's, I think it's really well written. But there are parts of it just kind of make me like narrow my eyes a little bit, and I'm like, I'm not sure about that. Hmm. Um, but overall, I think it's a very good homebrew, and I have released a subclass for it. I plan to release more subclasses for it. Nice. Um. But yeah. I just had a weird idea pop into my head for a drop bear druid. A drop bear druid. <laughs> Gosh, I've written Australian animal and barbarian totems. Oh, really? Some of what one of my favorite works probably, because there was a I wrote kangaroo crocodile kookaburra. I don't know if you're familiar mm. with the kookaburra. Uh, very loud as and an annoying, animal. as far as I know. Very loud and annoying. Um, if you have, whenever you get a moment, you like during the interview after it, whatever, yeah. look up kookaburra laugh will not regret it. But when I wrote my kookaburra <laughs> paint animal totem, its thing was kind of similar to zealots, except it did, it kind of did less damage, had a rider and did psychic damage. And whenever I showed mm. it to people, they were all like, why does this thing deal psychic damage? And I would just send them the video of the kookaburra <laughs> laughing. And they're like, what the hell? What is that? <laughs> oh man. It's quite funny. <laughs> Australia has to be a pretty uh, inspiring place though, for like a lot of brew ideas. Oh my gosh, you don't even you don't even like know the half of it. There is so many like cool there's so much cool nature here. There's so many cool animals. It's such an awesome place to live. I actually love it in Australia. Although I will say, one thing I don't love about living in Australia is that whenever I post homebrew, this is like my two minute like rampage. I just have this moment. Is that whenever I post homebrew and I get comments where people are like, oh, you've spelt this wrong. And it's like a word like dueling, because in Australia we sell we spell dueling with two L's, mm. or like color. We have the U. Armor have the U. Oh, you use the, o. the English spelling. <laughs> exactly right, the proper spelling. But you'll get the like American, because like uh, Reddit is very much an American dominated uh, uh, social media, I would say. Mm. And so you'll get comments like, "Oh, you spelled this word wrong," and I'll respond and I'll be like, "Oh, I'm Australian." So that's why that's spelled like that. And a lot of the time, they'll just be like, oh, my bad. But sometimes I have gotten comments where, like, they'll say, um, well, actually, D&D is an American game, so you should use the American spelling because otherwise it's wrong. And I'm like, get out of here. No one cares. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are, you, what are you even doing? Do you, like, go around and post these kind of comments on everyone's homebrew or is it just you like, could smell that I was Australian? <laughs> you saw the U in armor and you're like, ah, oh, I'm going to get him. I'll show him for using, for putting that U in there. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, so sometimes it can be annoying, especially when it's like a very American-dominated site, but I don't get those comments too often. But Mm. when I do, it absolutely makes my blood boil. I hate it. (laughs) (laughs) I think one thing I actually... Well, well, there's two things. So first, I'd actually had a question submitted um, since I think word got out about uh, you being on the show. (laughs) A question submitted? That's crazy. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, someone wanted to know why some of your classes aren't a fighter subclass. Why some of your subclasses aren't a fighter subclass. <laughs> I'm going to kill. Ugh, I'm not even going to name them. They don't, even get the, they don't even get the satisfaction. Why some of my classes aren't a fighter subclass. Well, person, whoever you are, um, sometimes I like writing other things. Maybe a sorcerer subclass, maybe a full subclass. A full, a full class, or a full subclass, a full class, and that's okay. I'm allowed to do that. So you can, you can, you can go away. I'm, I'm gonna write. I'm gonna do whatever I want. <laughs> Honestly, that's too funny. Oh, I'm gonna kill him. <laughs> In case it wasn't obvious, I think that's an inside joke from uh, the Reddit. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, there's a if you I think there's a comment on I think it's on Exemplar if if you want to find out the 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 T on that there's a I think it's an Exemplar there's a comment mm. yep there it is I can see it right now it's on Exemplar <laughs> <laughs> you can comb through that uh, the comments there if you want to uh, get the scoop fair play fair play and uh on a well on a more serious note <laughs> just realized this is a bit of a weird segue um. <laughs> So I don't know if you know about the Adam Cobell controversy that happened a while back. Oh, I don't think I do. Mm, um, I don't know if it's worth talking about then. <laughs> are they, who, wait, who are they? Uh, he's the guy who made Dungeon World for Apocalypse System. Okay. See, you say it's not worth talking about, but now now I'm invested. <laughs> now I just, I just want to know what happened, <laughs> at the very least. <laughs> okay, so a little bit of background. Adam Cobell is a game designer. Um, he created the Dungeon World system, which is basically like the D&D setting for Apocalypse um, System. Uh, what was the full name of it? Um, Powered by the Apocalypse. Oh, um, I think I have heard of that. Yeah, it's like a largely kind of narrative system um, that yep. works really well for like running games that play like a serial TV show. Yeah, yeah. Um, but basically, this guy Adam Cobell, he got in some hot water um, because he's been a, one of those like advocates for like um, being very aware of player safety, um, being very careful around like sexuality and gender and being like really open and accepting. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, he's been like a huge advocate for that style of DMing. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but he got in hot water because on his streamed uh, show, uh, he does like a, one of those sort of like critical role style, like web series. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in his game, he subjected a player to the situation where they were playing a robot, I think, and they went into like a random shop for some routine maintenance uh, to get like their hit points restored or something along those lines. And he played the mechanic as flirting with them. Uh, the robot in question was being played by a woman. Uh, the character was male, I think. And he role played the situation to. I think like the background on it was that the player had said something along the lines of like in future games, they want to have their experiences broadened like um, for their character so that they could react to more things being like this fairly insulated Mm -hmm. character that hadn't experienced much of the world. So this was like their kind of arc story arc was going into the world and having more experiences. Yeah. Uh, He interpreted that as having the mechanic, first of all, kind of flirt with the character get kind of ambiguously rejected and then while they were uh what's the right phrasing for this while they were in a vulnerable position uh inserted a microchip that allowed them to have an orgasm or something along those lines oh no so like in the abstract it was kind of sexual assault but in like a yeah. very sci-fi and abstract way i mean the player yeah. was uncomfortable As they should be. Yeah. And I think the other players around the table were giving each other some looks. Um, But it didn't really get properly 
called out until after everything had happened. And obviously mm. the player base went mental over this. Um, but again, it was in a very abstract scenario where there is this kind of fuzzy line between acceptability and he was kind of playing it off as a joke. And that really soured the way that it was interpreted by the audience as like, oh, you think sexual assault is funny. And it's like, mm. it's this really blurry line. And yeah, obviously being that he has like this very high status as someone who's supposed to be uh, being an advocate of like player safety and comfort and awareness of these kind of situations, it kind of fell on him all the harder. Mm, absolutely. As it should, I would say, like, I think to do that to a player is like, absolutely not, in, not appropriate at all mm. um, at any table. And like, I've played characters. I'm currently playing a character that I've like, is that is like fairly like flirty, like he's sexy I'm very like comfortable with his sexuality, and but when I made that character was was making that character, I was like to my dungeon master, I was like, "This is how my character, this is how I envision my character. He's fairly like you know flirty, um, like fairly like sexual character. He's like a gladiator, and he likes to put on a show." Um, and then I was like to the DM, I was like, "But so even if I'm like flirting with another NPC, I will never, I'll probably never role play that. I'll probably, I'll only ever say I flirt with X." And if that my character and that character, like that NPC do end up, I don't know, like having sex, quote unquote, like that's something that we don't need to, we can just like fade to black, done. That's mm -hmm. it. And I was like, he's like, that's fine. That's how I would run it. I was like, great. And then I went and checked with all the other players. I'm like, this is the character that I'm playing. And I want to make sure that you're all comfortable with that. And they were, they were fine with it. And I was like, great. And then like, that was, that was good. Cause you want to make sure that everyone at the, at, at the table is comfortable. For sure. With what's going on. And so especially around those situations, um, things like sexuality, gender, um, and things of that ilk, um, you just want to make sure that everyone is comfortable, everyone is safe, um, and you're not like triggering anyone accidentally. Because like, that's, that's been something that's happened in one of my games, is we've had like a situation where we didn't know that someone had... We had like a situation come up. I think it was in a fight. There was something that happened and then that made someone, you know, uh, one of the other players really uncomfortable. And that was something that we didn't expect because we hadn't had a conversation about it. Mm. And so now whenever I'm in games, I make sure I, cause I'm a player, I don't like start them, but I, I'll let the DM, I'll be like to the DM, like, Oh, you should have like a conversation just to check what everyone's comfortable with. And like, I've had DMS come up and be like, at the, they'll have a session zero and they'll be like, okay, I want to, I want you all to tell me like what, what are like your hard limits? Like, what do you not want to see in this game at all? Not crop up. And there's been games where people have like, I don't want anything sexual at all in this game. Mm -hmm. And the DM's gone like, yep, great, done. And I think accommodating for situations like that is like really important to make sure that everyone is safe, everyone's, so that everyone's able to have fun because that's what D&D is about. And if I was sitting at a, like if I was sitting at that table and that was to happen, I would be like appalled at that at that kind of behavior from a dungeon master. Mm. Um, yeah. To hear that that happened is like really unfortunate, but I think I feel so bad for that player, but um, I think making sure that um, like everyone is able to be comfortable at the table is like the most important thing you should do in Dungeons and Dragons, making sure that everyone is in a space where they feel like they can be their character without risk of uh without risk of uh being put into a situation that makes them uncomfortable yeah exactly and i think that's like part of the importance of like the zero session um is that you mm. can pull out like the consent checklist for what you are and aren't comfortable with in terms of content even if they're filled mm -hmm. out anonymously and then like handed yep. to the dm later like yep, absolutely because if you play long enough, you are eventually going to run into a situation where you have to ask, like, can my players get pregnant? <laughs> like, And that's really mm. for them to answer, like, either privately or, like, publicly, whatever they're comfortable with. Exactly. And it comes back. This is like all comes back to, like, the whole giving players agency. Mm. right? Because in that situation that, that you described earlier with the Dungeon Master and the microchip and all that, that character had no agency. No control of what was going on then. And that's... 
the, if you don't give players agency, those are the kind of situations that can arise. Exactly, um, yeah. And so making sure players have agency, very important, so that – because, like, it's, it's their character. They're attached to it. Let them have control over it and what happens to them. For sure. And taking those, like, preventative measures is, like, all the more expounded in that scenario because – it's very easy to see how a dungeon master can misinterpret a player's wishes first and foremost, and then Mm. in the moment be trying to make a joke out of something at the same time as not realizing how the player is responding to the joke. And then going so far as to like inject that kind of content. Mm. It's just like this perfect storm of things going wrong. (laughs) Yeah, and this is like happening to someone who has like been a community ambassador for like being cautious of this exact kind of thing like it can happen to anyone yeah absolutely and i think it's it's important as a player and as players to be comfortable um quite like saying when you're not happy with this because i feel like what can happen a lot of the time is if there's like not even necessarily it has like as like like dramatic or like as big as like something like sexual assault. Mm. Like I was in a game where the dungeon master, we were like dealing with undead. We were in like an undead fortress and the dungeon master really got into a description about like a decaying body. And like, it was really well described, but it was like, it left me because I'm a fairly squeamish person. I was like, actually like almost nauseated. I was like, Oh, I don't like this. Mm. (laughs) This is, this is a bit much. So at the end of the session, I, I like messaged the dungeon master. I was like, Hey, in the future, can we either like maybe like rein that in a bit or can you like provide it as like a handout for players to read like privately so I don't have to like read it or like let me know if you like feel like you need to do that kind of like description to like really get a point across and like let me know so that I can like maybe take a step back from the game for a moment, maybe get a drink of water and then sit back down once that's kind of passed. Hmm. And that was something that the dungeon and I were able to work out together and it worked out great and have, having that conversation being out, being willing to have that conversation with your dungeon master, um, is really important. Because at the end of the day, your dungeon master's primary goal should be that you and everyone else at the table is having fun. Hundred percent, yeah. If that no longer becomes their primary goal, it's probably not a table you want to sit down at. Exactly, yeah. Um, I think it's worth saying as well that, like, obviously, it's. I would say it's best for the DM to broach the subject. Um. Mm. I know that there's people out there who would make a fuss at the idea that, oh, that the onus is on the players to have to say something like, and I think it, it's somewhat fair to acquiesce to that. Not all players are going to have the interest or like the courage maybe to speak up on the subject, or maybe they themselves have run into a situation where they're sensitive to the subject and wouldn't want to bring it up. Yeah, no, Absolutely. I think courage is a good word for to use because, like, because what I would imagine would happen is there would be players that maybe they're confronted by a situation they don't like, but they're worried that, like, if they say something, they'll ruin the game for everyone else. Mm. Um, and I just, I just wish that there wasn't that, that didn't have to be a concern for them. That if you're if you're at, like a good table with for, like your friends, then they'll want you to speak up about things that don't make you comfortable because they'll want you to have fun. Because if you're not having fun, it won't be fun for them. Exactly, yeah. And there's nothing wrong, I think, with having like the ability to do a timeout and for either a player or the DM to say, like, okay, let's pause for a second and just discuss what's happening. Like, is everyone comfortable here? Like, <laughs> just do a little wellness check. Like, mm, No, absolutely. I absolutely agree. I think there was a scenario in the game that I was running where... My players were in like this story arc where they'd been enslaved by uh, space spiders. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were like forced into kind of a gladiator kind of arena thing. It was playing out a lot like the Spartacus TV show. Yeah. Um, and there was a situation where they were being taken to, I think like half the group were taken to like a sort of exhibition for like the fighters that would be featured in the games that were coming up and the Neoji slavers um, were all beholden to like this um, 
hierarchy of debt or ownership and stuff like that. So like any slaver above the owner of the slaves could uh, do anything they wanted with the ones below them, like be it mm. a slaver or a slave. So there was a situation that came up where one of the slavers um, grabbed the chains of one of the players and started dragging them off. And like the unspoken like um, inference was that something really bad was about to happen. And the sort of playoff joke of that was that when they were dragged into the bedroom, it was to have them read them a story to send them to sleep or something like that. And I mean, the players had no problem with the joke. Like it was, uh, it was taken well, but I can absolutely see that it wouldn't work at every table. And I even felt uncomfortable even using the premise of someone being dragged away to a bedroom as the basis for a joke being like really unsavory. Like it didn't sit well with me afterwards. No, I can, I actually agree completely. Like, because there'll be some players that like, they'll like, that'll happen. And they'll like, think that's a riot even. And then there'll be some mm. players that, like, they even begin to hear them, a player's being dragged off into a bedroom and they want nothing to do with it. Yeah, that's, like, re- um, means to just stand up and leave. Like, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, yeah, I think just as a dungeon master, I think it's important that you know know your audience, almost, in a way. Like, you know what your players are and are not comfortable with, and that's why it's important. Like, session zeros are super important in games. Mm. Yeah, I mean, even if you haven't had the chance to have that and you're like mid game, there's absolutely nothing wrong with like approaching your players, having the conversation and like mm. establishing boundaries later into a game. Absolutely. Completely agree. Well, I think one thing I would love to get you to do if you're, if you're okay with the time still, um, is to do mm-hmm. the homebrew challenge. The homebrew challenge. There's a homebrew challenge. Yeah. It's like this fun little segment that I've been, playing with recently where we get the the guests to try and brew something live on the show (laughs) on the show okay no sign me up i'm here for it it's gonna be complete garbage but i'll do it (laughs) (laughs) we've had like a big variety of um different things come out of this um and i like to preface by saying that you don't have to like provide numbers and like an exact stat block or anything like that like yeah It's just sort of an exposure to your creative process and seeing how you work through the situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you see, I'm going to roll a d20 and we're going to see what kind of thing you're going to have to brew. Please don't be a class. Please don't be a class. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, This is a race. A race. Hmm. Which is very broad. Um, Would you like some kind of a theme or subject? Um, Yeah, give me a theme. Give me a theme. Let's say a construct race. A construct. A construct. All right. So the first thing I do when writing races is I, because obviously in GM Binder, you can like hit like a thing that's like gives you like a, a snippet and it like will fill in like all the race information for you and like give you like example traits you can use. Mm. I delete the alignment section. Um, and you'll see this, if you look back through some of my races that I've posted, maybe not my super old ones, but more of my recent ones don't include the alignment section, mostly because I don't really vibe with alignment in like modern D and D, but that's like a whole different conversation. Um, so I get rid of the alignment section construct. I would probably, first things first, I like to think about kind of what they would look like. And for this, a construct race, I'm probably thinking I would love to make something a bit creepy mm. um because i think a lot of construct races are very like haha robot go burr and <laughs> true i'd like to go in a different direction so i'm thinking maybe they are a race of oh i've got it so they are a race of they look like birds almost and they've got like these beaks that are like these almost like these masks that attach to their face and they've got these like feathers and all that but what they actually are is the race is just the mask itself. <laughs> and so like they are these like sentient mask creatures and their bodies are like formed around these masks and they happen to take on birds. Why do they happen to take on birds? Because they happen to take on birds because they are from the shadow fell and they worship mm. the Raven queen. Very cool. <laughs> they are constructs that worship the Raven queen 
Why do they worship the Raven Queen? Why do these construct mask birds worship the Raven Queen? They worship the Raven Queen because, because long ago in the Shadowfell, there was an adventuring party and they were fighting a horde of undead. And unfortunately, there was an Aarakocra cleric that fell in battle and the undead lich, whatever, used a spell to strip the skin from his bone. And the Aarakocra <laughs> fell in battle, unfortunately, because obviously you killed the cleric first. Um, <laughs> and the battle waged on. It got really tense at one point, And towards the end of the fight, the lich was almost like almost doomed, but the fighter had lost his weapons. And so he took the skull of this Aarakocra and he smashed it into the lich, killing him. And this... And, like, left. He, they completed their mission. Everyone left happy after, except the Aarakocra. <laughs> and then over time, this Lich's negative energy seeped into this skull. And that they were raised as the first of this race. The skull acting as this mask for this bird-like creature. This construct that now lived in the Shadowfell. Didn't know anything. No memories. Um, only knew kind of the cycle of life and death that kind of permeates there. So that's how they were born. That's how this race was born. Um, as far as traits go, now that I know that they're based on this kind of tale of a cleric and this lich, I probably want to do have a feature that... Actually, no. I'll backtrack. Ability score improvements. Um, probably because they come from both a lich and this cleric, I'd probably give them intelligence wisdom. Mm. Probably two into one whiz. Actually, yeah, two in one whiz. Um, and then, so I feel like, I don't think that's something, I don't think two in one whiz exists as a combination that, on the race. I'm trying oh, to that's like, a rare one. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, it's kind of like a representation of both like the Lich and the, the Ar- this Aarakocra cleric. Um, so I've got ability score improvements. That could be medium because... Every race is. They have 30-foot walking speed. Traits. Um, well, first things first. We'll make it so that when they die, when this rate, when you, if you die as a player, you, um, you, your body disintegrates and all that remains is your, the mask that you have, that you're, I don't even know how this race is created past the first. It's not important. Um, <laughs> but you have this mask, and it's all that remains of your body. And this mask can always be used to resurrect your body. And if a resurrection spell is cast on your mask, that is like suitable for being cast as if it's on your a part of your body. And your body like reforms out of this mask if you're resurrected back to life. And mm. just tack on resistance to narcotic damage to that, because why not? Um <laughs> Because you're wearing a mask, you can't speak. You don't have a moving mouth, so we'll probably give them some form of telepathy. Um, something that's not super egregious, because sometimes a lower level type of telepathy can be a bit like that. It can be a bit, ooh, this is a bit crazy. Mm. It's probably just like one creature at a time, and maybe low range, but it, the range gets higher as you gain levels. And like at higher levels, maybe like fifth level, at, maybe it starts at 30, and at fifth level it goes to 60. Um, I feel like I have to give them innate spell casting. They are like literally based on a cleric and a wizard, <laughs> or like a cleric skull being bashed in the face to a wizard. So I absolutely have to give them some spell casting. Probably cleric spells that are like necromancy themed. So in my head, what are cleric spells that are necromancy themed? Toll the Dead mm-hmm. as a cantrip. Intelligence would probably be their spell casting ability for it, though. Toll the Dead, probably give them at first level. I want to say cause fear, but I don't actually know if that's on the cleric spell list. I don't think it is. Maybe inflict wounds? Inflict wounds is good. We'll give them in cause, uh, Toll the Dead inflict wounds. And at second level, maybe something that's less damage based. Uh, how about. You know, it's not, a, it's not a cleric spell, but we'll do. What's the spell? The one that makes you super weak. There's like a ray of enfeeblement? Yeah, that sounds right. Great, we'll do Ray of Enfeeblement as well. So they have telepathy, they can cast some spells, and that's standard spell casting trait, so like they get that back when they finish long rest, and they can cast a cantrip whenever they want. Um, spell casting, telepathy, resistance to necrotic damage, can be resurrected from mask. Um, because they can't speak, 
um, whenever they perform the uh, sonomantic part of a spell, when well, sonomantic no verbal part of a spell, they there's instead like a uh, kind of an effect that appears around the head. Maybe the like the eyes from the mask glow, or there's like shadows dance around them just to make it obvious that they are in fact casting a spell. <laughs> um, and then that's something that the player can flavor to their liking. Languages, common, probably two of choice. I'd go, I don't want to give them like Aarakocra Ara- or Auron because it doesn't, because I, I imagine they'd like lose their memory, so it doesn't really make sense. Mm. But I'd probably do two of choice just because they do come from a lich, and liches are pretty smart. So I feel like they might know more than one random language. Maybe they know two random languages. I wish there was a Shadowfell language. I don't think there is, though. I think maybe like Undercommon might be the closest. Undercommon would be the closest. And even then, that's not doesn't super fit well. No, that's more like Underdark, give, right? Yeah. I'd probably just, just two of languages of choice. Do they need another feature? What have I given them? Telepathy? Spells? A mask that they can cast spells through? Probably do need something else, something small though. Um, maybe deep speech. They can deep speech. Actually, deep speech would be probably be pretty good for them. Yeah. Okay, we'll give them common deep speech and one of choice because I like the idea of them having a few more spells. Um, and I am we'll curious. Give them religion. Uh, oh, a religion. Religion proficiency. They can have proficiency in religion checks because they they revere the Raven Queen as she upholds. The cycle of life and death, even though they live in juxtaposition to that, because they are mm. creatures of death, which I find quite funny that these creatures like are like, yes, Raven Queen, we love you, and she's like, you are literally everything I'm fighting against. <laughs> <laughs> you represent everything I hate, and they're like, yes, Queen, go off, <laughs> <laughs> preach. <laughs> Obviously, they can't talk, so they wouldn't say that, but they would be thinking it. <laughs> Uh, so that would probably be my construct race. Would probably be these masked bird-looking dudes that are dead. No fly speed. Dead-ish. Death, dead adjacent, I would say. That's fair. That's fair. I am curious. What's your opinion on uh, racial flying speed? Racial flying speed? No. Never. No. <laughs> Don't let it happen. Um, Asimar is okay because it is a um it's like a, a use ability you use it and it's gone yeah it's like a minute yeah um yeah no i've written an aracocra patch i don't like it i've been meaning to release an update to it that removes the flying speed entirely and makes it more akin to like asimars but obviously if i if you were to like post an aracocra variant and it didn't have a flying speed everyone would kind of look at you funny Hmm. Um, but yeah, I think that flying speed on races just can't be justified in any way. I just don't think that there's a way you can do it with it being balanced. Because I I am against the idea of giving races powerful traits and then also giving them drawbacks to compensate. I don't think that's a good way to design a race because I, I just don't think it makes it very satisfying. Um, some examples of that are the, the Volos Cabalds, which I've written a patch for. Um, where mm-hmm. they get minus two to strength, but get pack tactics, and then like have sunlight sensitivity, and then drow as well have sunlight sensitivity, which I just think is a crap trait. And like I understand why they have it, but I just don't think it's fun for a player. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's probably my sweeping thoughts on races. Very cool. <laughs> races in Dungeons and Dragons, anyway. Um, <laughs> awesome. That's a really cool race. Yeah, I've seen some like really interesting approaches to trying to like brew flying into car- like into races. I think like mm. there's um a moth folk race where they get the ability to glide. So they basically have like slow fall. Um Yeah. No, that's perfect. I love that. Oh yeah, and there's like one sub race, I think, that can like jump uh especially high and then glide from there, but they can't gain any height as a result after they start falling or something like that. Yeah, it's yeah. weirdly worded. Yeah, it would have to be for that kind of feature. But, you know, that kind of thing is loads better than just slapping. You have a flying speed of 50 feet. Thanks, <laughs> elemental evil. Uh, <laughs> my first character in Dungeons & Dragons was an Aarakocra. And the second I took to the air, I knew even 
as a meager first session player, I was like, this is completely busted. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? But why exactly is that, though? Um, you're giving a player access to something that is viewed as a valuable resource, which is flight. Additionally, you are having to force the dungeon master to think of combats in three dimensions well before they would have to otherwise, um, and think about and even encounter building. You have to build encounters so much differently once a player has access to flight, like even the fly spell. Um, and once you just add a add a player that can fly at will, like like the Aracocker can, I just don't. Mm-hmm. I think it's a recipe for disaster. I just think the player has to either be like punished for having a flyer speed flying speed which isn't satisfying like when i was playing aracocca my dm would make me make like concentration checks to maintain flight and i was like this sucks i'm a bird i should just be able to fly and like it just was it just wasn't it just wasn't fun because i never felt like i was able to like fulfill that flying fantasy while the dm felt that like he couldn't control me um and so i just think that flying on races is just not the way to go so i think this is the one thing that i would disagree on um if anything i think that flying from low levels should be better supported um in terms of like giving the dm proper instruction on how to manage it and incorporate it uh, as well as like i think there are some low level flying enemies maybe not that properly like integrate the more tactical side of flying with things like the the flyby attacks and stuff like that. The dragons get later. But I think it would be really good to see like um, a class which is intentionally designed around flight um, mm-hmm. from like first level and then like maybe subclasses that offer different methods of approaching that. Like um, sort of like how the Warlock has the level one uh, subclass where you have like either a mechanical or like a creature or um, some magical method of like a broom or something is like your a method of flying. And then the subclass mm-hmm. expands on incorporating uh, skills based around your method of flight. And then like incorporating that from first level would be an interesting approach. Mm. No, I can absolutely agree that a class based on flying would be super interesting. I just think that um, giving it as a racial trait is not the way to go. Because hmm. um, if you have flying on a class, you know it's bound to that class, whereas if you have flying on a race, suddenly it's available to every class. Okay, yeah. I think that's yeah, that's a fair um, way to put it. And then... And, like, you already have situations where, like, a, like a gnome ranger can get, like, a vulture, and suddenly they're up in the air. Or a <laughs> gnome wizard uh, casts reduce on themselves and then flies around on a mage hand. Um, yeah, um, I believe that's, I believe that's possible rules as written. A gnome can cast reduce on themselves and then fly on a mage hand. Um, that's that's some crazy rules lawyering. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There's some pretty nut stuff you can do in Dungeons and Dragons when you get really nitty gritty about it. Um, but (laughs) yeah, I think, I think my biggest problem with like I said, races flying on races is that it just becomes a matter of um, can like can this class cope with flying this early, and especially if like Aracocra was more like widely accepted, which I think by and large people basically disregard the Aracocra and don't like don't allow it. I don't think it's allowed in adventure adventure league games, for example. Um, I think if it was more mainstream. I think homebrew would be really stifled because of it, because suddenly everyone would have to be thinking, ah, oh, crap, what about the flying race? Oh, no, my homebrew <laughs> isn't balanced for the flying race. Oh, I have to rethink everything. Um, yeah, it's a strong argument. So, yeah. That's probably... Because, I mean, flying is such like an attractive thing, though. Like, mm. the, the concept of like flying. So cool. So cool. Um, but, yeah, I do think limited racial traits at least on races is the way to go as far as flying goes interesting we might have to set you up for a conversation with nerdhog i think he wrote a uh what was it like an entire article for his website about oh, no. like why aracocra justified or something like that <laughs> i will fight him to the death no, it's fine. <laughs> 
<laughs> there you go. That can be your first bringing homebrewers together. We can all discuss flight on races. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I think that probably rounds off the conversation. Like uh, we've been awesome. on for like two and a half hours. I know. Look at us go. We are just got through everything. We're just flying by. <laughs> flying by. Was that the joke? No. <laughs> committed to it? I was going to make a Star Wars joke. It was really bad. I'll start trekking. Okay. No, flying by was excellent. I approve. Whew, we got there. <laughs> yeah, but thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me on the show. This has been so much fun. No, absolutely. Thank you for spending the time. It's like always love having these conversations, and yeah, yours is up there with the best. Oh, flatterer! <laughs> <laughs> <It's a> high <laughs> charisma. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Though that means a lot. Absolutely, and uh, yeah, I'd love to have you back on at some point in the future. Absolutely, I would love to come back on at some point in the future. And talk and give more bad opinions about Dungeons and Dragons. I have so many. <laughs> There's spicy Australian barbecue takes. Yeah, basically. Just whip out the barbie, get out the kebabs, the shrimps, <laughs> shrimp on the barbie. <laughs> oh, we've officially gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> but awesome, man. Well, thank you again. And uh, yeah, have a lovely evening. You too. Bye. Take care. Thanks again to Rain for joining us. If you like the sound of his work and want to check it out, there are links in the description to his Reddit and Tumblr accounts where you can see his material. Join us next time when we'll be talking to our first guest from outside the D&D community, Kazumi Chen, a teacher and game designer specializing in ethnosensitivity. And of course, last but not least, thank you for making it to the end. And until the next adventure, stay safe. I think there was a tirade I went on earlier, and I, I was saying it. I'm like, this makes no sense, but I'm going to own it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to go down like the long way in order to find the short way back. <laughs> exactly. People are going to listen to this and be like, what the fuck is he on about? It's like, it's just me. I'm, being, I'm living my truth. <laughs> <laughs>